Devotion. Would you call yourself a devoted person? Would you say in each area of your life, your family, your business, your career, your church, your relationship with God, would you say you are a devoted person? Let's read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, Acts Two. This is the beginning of the church, right? This is the birthday of the church. The Holy Spirit is poured out at the beginning of the chapter. They began to pray with the Holy Spirit, and they came out of that upper room, and they began to preach, and thousands of people started getting saved even on the first day. And, and, and this launch of the New Testament church was happening, and it says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly. They were devoted to the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul. In other words, a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were done. In the New Living Translation, it says it like this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all and many miraculous signs and wonders were done. Sometimes people say, I wonder why we don't see more miracles. Well, I would say, do we have that devotion? Do we have that devotion? Devotion releases the power in any aspect of life. Devotion reveals the potential, the possibilities in anything that we do. You'll not know what could really be until you devote yourself. And in a culture where we tend to try things, we, we kind of want to sneak up on them. We don't want to sell out. We don't want to buy in. We don't want to be devoted. We tend to test it a little bit. In that kind of a society, I wonder how much we miss in every part of life. I'm not going to be devoted to one person. I want to have several. I'm not devoted to one cause or one mission. I'm open to many things, not devoted to a calling or a purpose. I'm just waiting to see. I wonder in a culture like that how much we miss because it's devotion that reveals the potential, that that releases the power, that shows the possibilities in anything that you do. Without true devotion, you'll never know what could have been. Devotion to music, to sports, academics, family and relationships, and even to God and God's house. How many played an instrument where you were in school? I I was uh, excited about music when I was young. And so fourth grade, we started playing the tonettes, right? Did you play tonettes? And then the fifth grade, I started playing the clarinet, the piano, and the organ, and the drums. So I was in music classes all day, and I had private classes uh, several times. Where's mom? My mom was spending money on organ lessons and piano lessons and taking me around to all these different... I was doing the clarinet, the piano, the organ, and the drums, trying to learn them all, right? And I'm excited. I love music. I'm going to be the next Paul McCartney. How many played an instrument when you were in school? Okay, we we want you all on the praise team. (laughs) So I practiced and I played and I took the lessons for fifth grade and sixth grade and seventh, eighth and junior high. I was in about four different bands, right? We had the jazz band. We had the rock band. We had the the concert band. We had the the, the marching band. we We had all the bands. I was in all the bands clarinet and the piano and the drums. And, and so then I had a teacher that said to me, you, 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 you need to get focused. You need to decide 
what you're going to do. And he tried to help me get devoted to one thing. But I thought I would play a little bit this morning, if you don't mind, just to show you the skill that I had. <laughs> Try to see if I can bring it out here. It's coming back to me now. It's coming. Okay, that's all I got. <laughs> after all those years, after all those lessons, after all the money my mom spent, how come that's all I got? <laughs> it doesn't seem right. At the same time, I went to Spanish class. <laughs> Yo hablo. <laughs> Espanol. I carumba. Tacos, burrito, <laughs> enchilada. That's it. Years of language class. I don't mean to break the heart of you teachers. It wasn't your fault. In fact, teachers who sometimes go home discouraged because of students like me. What's the deal? How come I can have years of piano lessons and I can't remember one song? How can we could take years of language at school and if we got dropped in that country, we would starve? <laughs> because it's about devotion. It's about devotion. Unless you give yourself, nothing you do will ever really impact your life or make a difference in your future. But when you do give yourself, when you devote yourself, you find the potential. You find the possibility. You find your true gifts and your true strengths. And all of a sudden, these things that God put in you begin to produce amazing results. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right there. That's amazing. <laughs> Devotion. Devotion is a powerful thing. Now, maybe it wasn't God's plan to, to have me devote my life to music or to some other thing. I never was very good at sports, and so I never really devoted myself. I would turn out, and I would play, and I'd be happy to be on the team. But I remember the day that I sat in my first class at Seattle Bible College, Ballard, North Seattle. Wendy was three chairs down. I was only to meet her shortly thereafter. And I devoted myself. You know, coming out of a drug rehab center and struggling to get through high school. In fact, it was music teacher that got me through high school. And all the problems and all the stuff I'd been through. When I got into theology and, and studying the word of the Lord, I, I completed that four-year program as the valedictorian of the class. I started college. Think about this. I started college not knowing how to find the books of the Bible and graduated with a bachelor's in theology as the valedictorian of the class. Devotion changes everything. What if you got devoted to God? What if you got devoted to prayer? What if you got devoted to his word? What if your relationship with God became more than just a casual, once in a while idea and it became a passion in your life? Yeah. Woo! Who knows what God has planned for us? One of the things that I'm realizing the older I get is that 
The, the issue in our life is not the call. Now, now, when I grew up, people in my position that stood behind the pulpit, they would, use, and, I, and again, I don't want to downplay this, but they would use phrases like, well, I received my calling, or this is when I was called, or this is when I knew I was called. And the, the context was, you know, that's when I knew I was called to be in ministry, standing behind a pulpit, and, and there was somehow this call that came to them. The older I get, the, I, the more I realize the call's not the issue. Everybody's called. Every single one of you are called to change the world. Every single one of you are called to lead in whatever realm you're in, and you're all called to carry the presence of God. You're all called to be part of a team that's changed the world. Maybe not everybody is called to lead at a national level, but everybody is called to lead locally, and everybody is called to be a part of a national team that's changing the world. This is the mandate on your life. When Jesus said disciple nations, he was not speaking to a few select individuals. He, he, he wasn't saying disciple nations, and that's for a handful of you that I call. And then we receive the call, and then now it's our job to, to, to disciple nations. When he said disciple nations, he's speaking to everybody. What separates you is not your call. It is the response to the call that separates you. What separates you is the yes. Elisha, Elisha tells the, the prophet, he said, listen, go find Jehu. He's going to be in Ramoth Gilead. But, and I'm about to speak to him, and I'm about, he's about to have an encounter with me, and I'm going to send him to shift the atmosphere in the nation. But what was required of Jehu, that Elisha made sure this prophet knew, he must, he must separate himself to an inner room. He must stand up and separate himself to an inner room. This was the requirement. The issue is not the call on Jehu's life. The issue and what separates him is the requirement to separate himself. We, you know, there's a, we've mentioned this before, but there's a verse that in my 20s, I, it used to bug me. I, it, would, it, would, it would stress me out. Jesus said twice, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. And I'm passionate, and I'm in my 20s, and I want to change the world, and I want to go after God. And I would read that verse, and I'd be like, I don't understand that verse, but it drives me crazy. Like, why are many called, but few are chosen? I'd get before the Lord in prayer and be like, Lord, I don't want to be in the called category. I want to be in the chosen category. I don't just want to be called. I want to be chosen. But I don't know how you get from called to chosen. And why are many called, but few are chosen? And it would just stress me out. <laughs> and then I read that verse in context. In Matthew 22, Jesus is telling a story about a king. And a king sends an invitation out to come to the wedding of his son. And the first wave of people that he sends, the first invitations, all of the people, they all have excuses. They all downplay and they all have reasons why they don't come to the wedding. Then there's the second invitation that goes out. The second invitation, they all have excuses why they don't either. Finally, on the third, they come. And then he ends the story by saying, many are called, but few are chosen. This is the illustration we use with this. One of the things I hate in life, like hate with a, with a passion, is moving, like physically moving. I hate moving. I did it a year ago. Like when I lived in Reading, we lived in a house for 14 years. I didn't want to move. It just, I, I hate moving. I hate the whole pro. I, I hate packing. I hate thinking about it. I hate having to load it up. I hate having to go get the U-Haul. I, I hate... I hate moving furniture through doorways that it doesn't fit and you're banging your hands the whole time. I hate that it's in the middle of the summer and it's 110. I hate unpacking. I hate the whole thing with a, with a deep passion. But what I hate more than moving is I hate helping other people move. I hate that even worse. I hate it even worse. And and you know, and it's always like people, all, what they're asking you is, can you give up an entire Saturday in the middle of July when it's 110? And can you come to my house and move a bunch of furniture through doors and pack and take your whole day? And what I'm gonna do as a thank you is give you a few slices of pizza. This is what they're asking. And then it drives me crazy if they like do little Facebook invites, like they start a little moving group and they call it like, we're having a moving party on Saturday, do you wanna come? As if that's fooling anybody. A party, yes! No, I don't wanna come. But the problem is, and this is what we talk about, is that in America, and if you're from another country, it could be the same there, but in America, the true test of friendship is whether or not you'll show up and help somebody move. 
easily. If you are unsure or uncertain if this person's a friend, tell them you're moving on Saturday. If they show up, they're a friend. If they don't, they were lying and faking it the entire time. They're not real friends. This, this is the deciding, this is the line in the sand for friends. And so the dilemma that I get in is when people move and they come and ask me, hey, will you help me move on Saturday? I, I, I know I'm like stuck, because if I don't show up, you're gonna realize I'm not really your friend. And everything in me doesn't want to come. So if you can imagine this, that Gabe comes to me one day and there's a group of guys and Gabe's like, hey, can you, you know, can you come help me move on Saturday? Well, immediately all of us are like, you know, don't make eye contact with Gabe as I'm <laughs> frantically trying to find some reason why I can't come on Saturday. I know there's something I have to do. I can't, no. And then, you know, and then one guy raises his hand and says, I'll, I'll help you move, Gabe. And Gabe says, well, then I choose you. In the kingdom, this is how it works. The issue is not the call. The reason why there are many called but few are chosen is because there's only a handful that raise their hand. God comes and says, you're called to disciple nations. He calls and says, you're called to lead in revival. You're called to give yourself fully for the glory of God on the earth. This is the mandate and the call on your life. What separates you is not that call. It is whether or not you raise your hand. Jesus comes in a place like this and he, he says, listen, who will be leaders in revival? Who will give themselves fully to see my glory fill the earth? Who will be the ones that disciple nations? And all of us are one, you know, we're all like, I got some excuse somewhere and I just don't know if I can, you know. And then there's somebody that raises their hand and says, I'll do that, Jesus. And Jesus says, well, then I choose you. The way you get chosen in the kingdom is you raise your hand. You raise your hand. It's what's required. The Lord has an anointing and a message and authority for you. The way you get it is you raise your hand. That's how you get it, to separate yourself. And what he requires from you is that you separate yourself, is that you respond. You want to be in the chosen category. You get in the chosen category by raising your hand. A Christian life and your walk with God takes a wholehearted devotion. We're not here just trying God. We're not just kind of testing the waters. We're in. We're all in because we believe Jesus is Lord. And if he is Lord at all, he is Lord of all. You believe it? If he's Lord at all, He's Lord of all. We didn't say, Jesus, you're my sometimes Lord, part-time Lord. When I need you, Lord, I'll call you if I need you. No, we said, Jesus, you are Lord. That's how you become a Christian. Great people, godly people say things like Psalm 27 and verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek. I just love that, right? It's focus, it's, it's devotion, it's, it's passion. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Do we have that kind of passion? Do we have that kind of desire? Do we have that devotion? When they asked Jesus about the greatest commandment, he said, here it is. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. But he added something. He told them how to love God. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. But he added how to love God. Look at it in your Bible with me. Matthew chapter 22. Are you there? Got your iPad going? Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Wow, that's pretty specific. I mean, that's really getting down. Not just all your heart, but all your heart and your soul. Not just all your heart and your soul, but all your heart and soul and mind. That, that means we don't have time for tripping. 
That means we don't have time for spacing out. That means we don't have any time to let our mind wander and doubt and question and argue and get caught up in strife and negativity and worldliness. If you do what Jesus said, you'll be wholly devoted to the Lord. Love God. Love people. With all your heart. With all your soul. With all your mind. In my 30-some years of experience working with people, I can say most of our troubles come because we let our mind go elsewhere. We let our thoughts go elsewhere. We let our soul get affected by other things. We let our hearts be consumed with other things. And then struggles start. Problems start. The addictions, the affair, the economy, the finances... If we could get devoted, love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. If we had that kind of devotion, you'd find that most of your struggles are gone. Most of your problems, you just blow right through them. You'll take them out like Goliath under David's slingshot. If you're all in, there's no room for doubts, fears. Worries and compromises. Fruitful, productive Christianity takes all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. If you devote yourself, you will see the power of God. That's what Jesus said. What's the great commandment? Love God. But you got to do it with all that is within you. Can't be lukewarm. Can't be half-hearted. Got to be devoted. Paul said it like this to Timothy. 1 Timothy 4, verse 15. He said, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be seen by all. In other words, when you give yourself entirely, everybody will see that devotion. It will produce results that are visible. Another translation said it like this the American standard. Be diligent in these things. Give yourself wholly to them, and your progress will be manifest to all. The fruit, the result, the increase, the prosperity, the healing, the blessing, the joy will be seen by all when we give ourselves wholly. The New Living Translation said, give your complete attention to these things. Throw yourself into them, and everyone will see your progress. David wrote in Psalm 9, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. And verse 3 says, your enemies will turn back. I love it. Let's praise God. Let's serve God. Let's live for God with our whole heart. And you know what? Everything that comes against you is going to turn back. They're going to give up. They're going to quit. We're still here. We're still standing. We're still believing. We're still following God because we are devoted. Come on. Some folks come. Some folks go. We're still here walking with God, obeying God, serving God. And when we've been standing in heaven around the altar of the throne for a thousand years, we'll say, man, I'm glad I was devoted. A few short years on earth, a few hard years on earth, a few testing years on earth are worth the glory of eternity, worshiping God, serving God, following God. There's this incredible moment in 1 Kings chapter 3. In this chapter, Solomon is sleeping, and the Lord appears to him in his sleep. And he says, ask what I shall do for you. I know this is material we've talked about before, but I I can't help but 
I'm just fascinated by how a person can be so intentionally trained for divine purpose that God can show up to them while they're sleeping and actually trust them to make a decision that will last for the rest of their life. He can trust them with a decision while they're sleeping. Because he's sleeping, God says, ask what I'll do for you. And Solomon says, I want wisdom. And the Lord says, you have what you've asked for. Actually, literally, he didn't ask for wisdom. He asked for a hearing ear, which gives us the other side of the coin. The hearing ear is what gives us access to wisdom. It's an acknowledgement. It is not a human wisdom. It is wisdom from another world. And if I don't hear you, I won't get it. And he prays this prayer in his sleep because he was prepared for purpose as a child, as a young child. He was groomed for the responsibility, privilege, and position of leading the nation of Israel. But the thing that preceded his prayer request was a confession. This is in 1 Kings 3. I'm sorry, I'm just making references. I... When we do it again, I'll be more, more teacher-like. <laughs> Maybe. He said, he said, God, I'm a, I'm a child. This is King Solomon. God shows up in his sleep, and he says, ask what I'll do for you. And he says, God, he says, I'm, I'm a child. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. I don't know how to carry this that you've assigned to me to be king. I don't know how to do it. I don't have the ability to go out and represent that office well and come back in here and live in a way that is consistent with my assignment. I don't have the capacity. And I've got this feeling that if you're not overwhelmed by your assignment, then you don't see your assignment clearly. Because just the revelation of purpose brought the most powerful man on the planet to his knees in his sleep. And he says, God, I've got to have a hearing ear. And the Lord spoke to me, said, because you didn't ask for wealth, fame, or long life, I'm going to give to you all the things you didn't ask for, and I'm going to give to you wisdom. It's very similar to the prayer, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added. It is a kingdom principle. When your priorities are right, there's a trickle effect on things you don't pray about. There's a trickle effect on things that don't matter to you that suddenly matter to God and they become some of the most pronounced parts of your life. 